In a previous Caspian report called The Decline of the Ottoman Empire, we discussed how the once proud Ottoman Empire declined into corruption, poverty, high inflation, public debt, and bureaucratic inefficiency, and how the country slowly but unintentionally transformed itself into the sick man of Europe. In this report we will continue on the Ottoman history and explain how the 18th century decision to modernize the military eventually led to a secular Turkish Republic dominated by the westernized military faction. Welcome to Caspian Report by me Shirvan. Ever since the independence of the Turkish Republic, the military faction has played a decisive role in the politics, economics and society of the country. During the 1960s, 1970s and the 1980s, the military ensured the secular nature of the Republic through a series of military coups. And even though the role of the Turkish military has diminished since the rise of the Justice and Development Party under the leadership of President Erdogan, the rise and fall of the Turkish military is part of the geopolitical objectives of a reasserting Turkey. To understand the role of the military in Turkish politics, we need to examine the history of the Ottoman Empire. At its golden century in the year 1536, the French king wrote the Ottoman Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, asking for help against the Austrian Habsburgs. The way the Ottoman Sultan replied and described his titles is actually more interesting than the content itself. I quote, The Sultan of Sultans, the Sovereign of Sovereigns, the dispenser of crowns to the monarchs on the face of the earth, the shadow of God on earth, the Sultan and Sovereign Lord of the Mediterranean and Black Sea, of Rumelia and Anatolia, of Karamania and the land of Rum, of Zulkadria Diyarbakir, of Kurdistan, of Azerbaijan, of Persia, Damascus, Cairo, Aleppo, of the Mecca and Medina, of Jerusalem, of all Arabia, of the Yemen, and many other lands which my noble forefathers and my glorious ancestors, may God light up their tombs, conquered by the force of their arms, and which my august majesty has made subject to my flaming sword and victorious blade. I, Sultan Suleiman Han. And then the actual contents of the letter starts. This introduction of titles shows the mentality of the Ottomans in that era. They perceived themselves as unstoppable world conquerors that were superior to any other nation or state. But when the Ottoman Empire lost the battle at Vienna in 1683, they gradually lost control over their holdings in Hungary and the Balkans. It was hard and painful for the Ottoman rulers to acknowledge that they weren't the masters of the world and if the last century of continuous military failures had proven anything, it was that the Ottoman Empire was inferior to the West in terms of military and warfare. But it also proved that the Ottoman Sultans had become subjects to their own traditional military unit, the Janissaries. In an attempt to undo the decline of his empire, Sultan Mustafa III established a new Western military institution in the year 1773, the Imperial School of Naval Engineering. Many of the instructors were of Western European origins, and the curriculum was based on secular, science-based European sources. The purpose of the institution was the modernization of the Ottoman military. It started with the navy but soon similar institutions were established for the army and thus started the process of secularization and Europeanization of the Ottoman officers and the military. The next century was met with great instability and rebellion within the empire. Much of the instability and fragmentation of the empire was accelerated by the Janissary faction. 
what used to be an effective military force transformed itself over the centuries into the biggest obstacle within the empire. So the Ottoman ruler Sultan Salim III sought to replace the traditional Janissaries by creating an entirely new infantry corps fully trained and equipped according to the latest European standards. By the year 1806, the new army of around 23,000 troops was ready. But the Janissaries' refusal to serve alongside the new army in the field meant that the new army couldn't be integrated into the standing army. Furthermore, the Janissaries who opposed the new army felt that their wealth power and livelihood was at stake, thus over the course of the next year the Janissaries rebelled against the Sultan and deposed him. By 1826 the new ruler Sultan Mahmud II also tried to abolish the Janissaries and succeeded. By forming a new modernized ethnic Turkish army the Sultan provoked the Janissaries to revolt. In the ensuing fight, the centuries-old Janissary guard was defeated and abolished. The Sultan then instituted extensive administrative, military and fiscal reforms. These reforms took on the name the Tanzimat, which literally meant the reorganization of the Ottoman Empire. The Sultan's sons and successors, Sultan Abdul Majid I, and Sultan Abdul Aziz continued the reforms and further westernized the military. But what effectively happened was that the Ottoman military underwent extensive modernization, which was based on secular and European sources, whilst the Ottoman rulers still held tight to the old religious doctrines and the traditional system of an absolute monarchy. So over the years, this created a gap between the new military and the traditional system. But this also paved the way for new political movements within the empire. First, there was the young Ottomans, who wanted to modernize the country without westernizing the society. This was followed by the Young Turks movement, who also wanted to modernize the country, but ended up destroying it during World War I. So when finally the Ottoman Empire collapsed, there was only one faction that stepped up. The Western secular educated officers. They took control of the situation and they won the war for Turkish independence and finally they established a secular republic with the ambitions of fully westernizing Turkey. This was all done under the leadership of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. But even if it wasn't for Ataturk who led the country to victory, it would have been someone similar from the same secular military with the same secular ambitions. With the independence of Turkey assured by the secular military, a secular government was inevitable. But since the military was the only genuine secular institution, they became the guardians of Turkish secularism and therefore to guard the secular laws and the secular constitution, the secular military had to take an active and dominant position in the politics of the country. Back then it made sense. So ever since the independence of the country, the military has played a dominant role in the Turkish politics and government. Over the course of the 20th century, the military dominated Turkish government fully transformed the country. The military figured that since westernization worked for the armed forces and actually saved the country from destruction, westernization might also work for the society, the economy, the diplomacy and eventually return Turkey to its regional power status. These massive reforms were accomplished mostly because of the support the military received from the Turkish public. You see, the military enjoyed immense high approval rates and there are several indicators that explain this. First on, the military is recognized as the national savior of the nation. Second, the military is admired for its indiscriminate conscription. The army conscripts from all across Turkey's social classes, ethnic groups and regions. And finally, the military is respected because of their stainless reputation.
until recently that is. These three indicators is what made the military so trustworthy in the eyes of the nation. For example, in 2002, the military enjoyed an approval rate of 79%. In the same poll, the Prime Minister received 7%, the national government also received 7%, the religious leaders received 32% and the media accumulated 47%. But in the past decade, the military has made a number of terrible decisions that allowed for the Justice and Development Party, or AKP for short, to subjugate the military. The American war in Iraq was a turning point for the military. When Washington asked for Ankara's military assistance in Iraq, the leading general remained silent on the issue and instead forwarded the risky decision to the AKP. In doing so, the army hoped that the blowback would fall on the AKP, but the AKP refused to participate in the war and thus for the first time, a civilian government had made a major foreign policy decision. And over the years, it turned out, Turkey's non-participation in the Iraq invasion was the right call after all. Another miscalculation happened in 2007 when the army issued a warning to the AKP on their official website, but they never acted upon it. So what quickly became apparent was that the military was an empty shell. By not using its influence, the military actually lost influence. Over the course of the same year, the Turkish law enforcement began a sweep of arrests against military and civilians on suspicion of conspiring to orchestrate a coup. This became known as the Adganikon trials. Since 2007, hundreds of people have been arrested, including army officers, renowned journalists, artists, university presidents, women rights activists, and many more all collectively charged with plotting to overthrow the government. Some of the people who were arrested were later on released, but the other trials are still ongoing and there is still no final verdict on the subject. By dragging on the Erganikon trials, the AKP under the leadership of Erdogan scandalized the army and broke their nationwide trust. Over the next years, the role of the military diminished, mostly because the military itself allowed it, as they didn't want to become the new Janissary order and hinder the country from becoming a regional power. So instead, the military conceded to work with the civilian government and the AKP. And since the start of the Arab Spring in 2011, that partnership has strengthened, as the military and AKP have actually put aside their differences. For the first time in centuries, both the military and the civilian government have each other's backs. And both acknowledge that they need each other if Turkey is to become a regional power once again. This is especially important if you consider the ongoing geopolitical cold war in the Middle East between Iran, Saudi Arabia and Turkey. But we will reveal more on this subject in the next video. For now, this was a Caspian report by me Shirvan. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to share it on your favorite social media pages. So thank you for watching, take care and sarol.